Mediterranean keto, I have been talking about it for close to a year now. And now we've got a little bit of a research. Okay, we're starting to push this over the goal line a little bit. So this video is going to be interesting. I'm gonna bring on uh, someone that I've worked with a lot, Nick Norwitz, and we're gonna talk about a particular paper that was just released in Frontiers in Medicine. Really cool stuff because we talk specifically about the ketogenic diet in the Mediterranean sense. Now, this is a study that I was a part of and I'm proud to be a part of, which is one of the reasons why I'm bringing it in front of you. Now, I will note, it goes on for about an hour and it's fairly dense in some pieces. So I don't expect you to fully just be in front of the computer screen the whole time if you don't wanna be, uh, but maybe turn this on and listen to it like a podcast, listen to it while you're cooking, while you're stuck at home, whatever, okay? Because it's very, very, very enlightening. We talk about lipids, we talk about how Mediterranean keto um, can affect inflammation in a lot of ways, but more so how it's affecting cholesterol and why you might see your cholesterol go up, why you might see some changes. Anyhow, really interesting stuff. Uh, I do ask if you haven't already, please hit that red subscribe button and then hit that little bell icon to turn on notifications. I'd also like to give a big shout out to Thrive Market. Uh, they're an online-based membership grocery store, so you can click on the link down below after this video and check out Thrive Market. They have a lot of good Mediterranean keto options. So I have like uh, keto bundles and everything like that, so you can get what Thomas would typically get at the grocery store. Anyway, after you listen to this or watch this, please do check them out down below in the description. You're not gonna wanna miss it out. So now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna bring on Nick Norwitz, and we're gonna talk about this Frontiers in Medicine paper. So hang on a second, let me go ahead and grab them. All right, so I've got my good friend and colleague, Nick Norwood. So Nick is a Oxford ketone PhD researcher as well as a Harvard med student. But the cool thing is he's the lead author on this paper. So he and I have worked together on a lot of different things, but this is a really cool study because it talks about the Mediterranean keto diet in such a positive light and so many things that, that I've talked about on my channel. So Nick, it's so good to have you on the channel, man. Thanks, man. It's so good to be here. Yeah, well, let's just go ahead and jump right in because I know everyone is, you know, their time is precious and we want to be able to just get this information out there. So give us kind of the overarching view of what this research was about. What was this, what is this paper all about? And then we can dive into the nitty gritty. Yeah. So the purpose of doing this paper kind of is, uh, I feel a lot of people go to their doctor, they're on a ketogenic diet, they've had great results for whatever, maybe it's weight, maybe it's irritable bowel syndrome, whatever it is, but they notice an adverse change in their lipids or a superficially adverse change in their lipids. Their GP freaks out. They say, get off the diet, go on a statin, or at least they suggest that. And um, people don't know then how to respond. It's like you're caught between a rock and the hard place. You're, you're obviously concerned about your heart health, but this seems to be working for you. So then the question arises, you know, we're learning more and more about cardiology, lipidology, are these changes we are seeing in blood lipids, you know, the increase in LDL in some people, Dave Feldman calls them the lean mass hyper responders. Mm -hmm. um, I'm one of those, my cholesterol shot up when I started keto. Is that actually a bad change or is it not? And I think we need to delve into that a little bit more deeply, get into a little bit more of the nuance than uh, most people appreciate. So in short, this is kind of a paper uh, for people to have in hand to bring to their GP if they have you know, negative changes, negative changes in their blood lipids uh, so that their, their doctor can look at it and say, oh, this is interesting. Maybe I should order these tests to get a little bit more informed about what's going on in your metabolism to see if this is good for you, this ketogenic diet, or maybe you should change it up. Yeah, and this is going to be cool because this is really going to give people a little bit more of a practical application for or for the research you know it's you you look at research and you don't typically have a way to say okay well how can i take this and show my doctor how can i take this and, and really get something out of it so because of the same kind of thing first two years that i was doing the ketogenic diet you know nine ten years ago my cholesterol was extraordinarily high and then eventually it did balance out um, but what was wild and which we'll talk about a little bit more is you know my inflammatory markers were significantly down so you know obviously we'll talk about that so it's like inflammation yeah. seemed to be down although cholesterol is higher and this study just it just goes right into yeah. it so yeah well those pieces totally integrate in the basics the basic tests we do when you get a standard lipid panel the doctor will just order like total cholesterol hdl ldl triglycerides and that's it and you don't really get to see you know the breakdown of different types of particles and how inflammation oxidative stress tie in yeah. and so what's kind of exciting about this paper if i will pat myself on the back a little bit is that um, in kind of an unprecedented manner, it delves into the nuances of lipidology, not just the superficial level. And so, you know, changes that 
look the same if you have an increase in cholesterol, say, eating a terrible McDonald's diet versus eating a clean Mediterranean keto diet. They're obviously very different metabolically, one would expect, but you don't see those changes on the lipid panels. And the type of lipid panels we do, you actually see the changes. Very interesting. Yeah. And that's obviously why I wanted to be a big part of this study. You know, as I, the Mediterranean keto piece, I, I promised it to my audience. I said, if I get, when we started releasing content surrounding the world of Mediterranean keto, which, you know, you and I have teamed up a lot on, um, you know, I said, hey, we're going to do everything we can to be able to feed the research with this. So, you know, I was honored to be a part of this study as well. So thank you for letting me be a part, be a part of and it and being able to. You very much followed up on your promise to your uh, viewers. I made sure that the last two words, I think, except for the references at the end, are yeah. Thomas DeLauer. <laughs> Everybody can go click on the paper and see that. Yeah, by the way, like we'll, we'll talk about the, the nitty gritty of this paper, yeah. but okay. we'll link, the, link below down in the description. So anyone that wants to you know, fully read the paper, you don't just have to take our word for it. You can, you can actually read the science yourself and print it out, take it to your doctor. But anyhow, Nick, so, Tell us just um, about the subject, what the situation was, what we're trying to accomplish, and then we'll dive in a little bit. Yeah. Um, so this particular subject, uh, um, adopt, was it going to adopt a ketogenic diet? This was um, about eight months ago, nine months ago. Okay. Um, and seven months, well, anyway, uh, about eight or nine months ago. And we predicted... Like, we thought this might happen, that you might have, because Dave Feldman's characterized these lean mass hyperresponders, he was of the phenotype. Um, so we thought, okay, might, there might be these weird changes in his blood lipids, so let's do this baseline test. Let's do an um, in-depth lipid profile like never before, so that we can follow him up over time. Let's do it in, it, it was a seven-month follow-up, um, and to see, you know, how things actually change. So we made this hypothesis which turned out to be correct, and we'll talk about that in a little bit of depth. Just to give a little bit more background, the reason this individual was starting a ketogenic diet was for ulcerative colitis and um, irritable bowel syndrome. The reason I mentioned that, um, well, it's mentioned in the paper, but that's another condition, just as an aside, that p clinicians report on widely that the patients who go on ketogenic diets for XYZ reasons have improvement in irritable bowel syndrome or colitis or Crohn's. Um, it's not actually reported on much, but we report on this paper that this uh, patient goes into complete remission, comes off all medications, and remains in remission, in wow. part because the inflammatory markers like drop to non-readable. Um, the HSCRP, which is a common inflammatory marker at, at follow-up, was less than 0 0.03, couldn't actually register. So inflammation went down. Yeah, Fine. well, um, yeah, and any, any kind of you know, ulcerative colitis or any kind of obviously inflammatory condition like that is, of course, at the very root inflammation. So and we've seen, you know, as far as nuclear factor kappa B, as far as NLRP3 with ketones, I mean, the research is pretty, pretty clear as day, right? So, um, so that's no real surprise. But I think yeah. when you get down to the gut level, there's probably even more that <laughs> hasn't even been discovered yet, realistically. Yeah, that's an understatement when it comes to the microbiome. Yeah. But yeah, for sure, for okay. sure. Okay, so you've got a, so you've got a 23, 24 year old individual who's suffered from ulcerative colitis. So he adopted a ketogenic diet. What kind of ketogenic diet did he adopt? It was a Mediterranean style. Now this was more or less inadvertent. It's the style I know you and I practice. We think mm -hmm. it's kind of optimal. We talked yeah. about it as like a perpendicular diet. You know, Mediterranean is all about the best types of foods. Keto is about your macros. So you find the intersection, and that's a awesome diet, at least as a start. Yes. Um, this individual just happened to really like that kind of food. He was already eating a Mediterranean style diet ish. Um, it just included a, like, uh, lots of fruit, for example, or higher carb vegetables, starchy vegetables, sweet potato and stuff. So very healthy diet. It wasn't like, and this is important because in some cases when people go from diet X to diet Y, if they're starting at a terrible baseline, then it's an unfair comparison. Totally. Um, I know we talked about the game changers before, and it's like, yo, we went on a vegetarian diet, and it was awesome, but then he didn't, like, he was eating KFC chicken nuggets for his protein before. So if that's your yeah. comparison, it's not fair. In this case, the, the subject was eating a very clean diet, all whole foods. It wasn't keto. It was Mediterranean-esque, but it wasn't keto. So he went on to a Mediterranean-style ketogenic diet, lots of fish, olive oil, avocados, lots of monounsaturated um, fat sources, tons of olive oil, like a cup a day, um, which wow. we're actually going to talk about the nuance of that at the end, because while things improved for the subject, I would argue, there were some things that 
didn't. And um, we can talk about olive oil hormesis later. Yeah, yeah. I want to uh, back up for one second because you, you said something. You, you, what people all really have to realize is, you know, keto is not, uh, ketones aren't necessarily a macronutrient. I mean, although they are kind of the fourth macronutrient, you're nailing it right here by showing that someone that was eating a clean diet and then going to just a, just a ketogenic version of that clean diet suddenly starts to see all these benefits and all the, you know, ulcerative colitis going into remission. I mean, that's just kind of, I don't want to say prove because we don't want to say that in the scientific community, but it's demonstrating that at least a ketone has an additional property outside of just being a macronutrient because you've got two clean diets, one that is glucose driven and one that is more ketone driven and you're seeing results of the ketone driven one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, just to kind of um, shameless plug again to, to myself and, but also uh, we, you did a video earlier very generously on one of my papers talking about ketones as not just the fourth macronutrient. People think about that, but that really doesn't appreciate what they are. They're also a very potent signaling molecule. Yeah. And in inflammatory disease, they, like if you talk about the two big controllers of inflammation, people hear about NF-kappa B and the NRLP3 inflammasome, ketones inhibit both of those. Plus a ketogenic diet has other anti-inflammatory effects, even just in the gut, for example, the release of bile acids. There were two papers, I think they were in Cell and Nature, very recently, 2019, showing that, you know, eating fats release, well, eating fats we know releases bile acids, which actually decreases inflammation further in the gut. So that's at least three ways ketones and ketogenic diet are reducing inflammation. Um, anyway. No, oh, very interesting. Well, yeah, we could go on and on about that. Yeah. So let's, let's keep, um, let's keep going on. So, so you adopted the Mediterranean style ketogenic diet and, and what happened? So I'm going to just look at the numbers to make sure I get them, per, um, proper, but what happened first is let's talk uh, like total cholesterol because that's kind of a number people people think about. Um, his total cholesterol started at um, 160 milligrams per deciliter. Now, based on the, um, basically when, when you get a lipid panel, the doctor doesn't really need to put much work into interpreting it because yeah. the high risk, moderate, and then optimal zones are predetermined. And at some point, maybe we can yeah. pull up the, the data and it'll show you like, oh, it's optimal. It's like pretty green and it's all safe. And then if something is out of the range, it'll be in red and like an alert. So a lot of the data are pre-digested already. This is another problem in the just data output. So in this patient originally, his total cholesterol was 160 milligrams per deciliter, which was considered optimal. Optimal in this test was less than 200 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. It almost tripled to 450 milligrams per deciliter. Wow. When it, yeah. like, oh, more than twice um, high risk, the high risk threshold. So yeah, that it, would, I mean, that would, that would freak out any, oh, not it, only any person, but any doctor. GPs. It freaked out a few piece. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that was quite alarming. And then the question next is, okay, um, we, we know, you know, people hear about total cholesterol, but you have good cholesterol, HDL. And bad cholesterol, LDL. Well, bad cholesterol. We'll get yeah, into more of that. Saying, air quotes. <laughs> air quotes. Um, so his HDL cholesterol did go up. Okay. Uh, it went from 48, which is already optimal. Optimal is above 40 in this case, to 109. Wow. So it went up really high. But if you actually think about what contribution that made to the overall jump, that's a you know 61 point jump, and the jump was what 290 points. Yeah. Most of it was LDL. So the major contribution was LDL. The LDL went up from 95, which is optimal, optimal in this case being um, uh, less than 100, to 321. Wow. Um, and so higher than 129 is considered high risk. So this was dramatically higher, much more than two and a half times higher than um, uh, the, the higher threshold for you know, what is high risk? So 321 is quite high, LDL. Um, and then his triglycerides are actually pretty stable. So the amount of the fat in his blood. Yeah. Uh, L LDL, by the way, just to clarify, HDL and LDL, they're uh, carriers for both cholesterol and for triglycerides. So the total fat in his blood that carried in the LDL and HDL particle was stable. Um, but the uh, cholesterol component did... Uh, could one, could one argue since this, you know, this individual is lean 
there was just less triglycerides to mobilize. Is that a, is that a, a hypothesis there too? Like if, if this had a, someone that was overweight and had a higher degree of body fat, would you have potentially have seen triglycerides higher? I think in that case, triglycerides would have gone down probably. Yeah. In this individual, we, he, he, we were actually trying to keep him weight stable or gaining weight. Whereas when people go on a ketogenic diet, generally they're losing weight. Ah, uh, very true. So, very true. Um, a lot of the the diet, the, the components of the triglyceride might have just been. I mean, yes, it was at least a twelve hour fast before you know after the last meal okay. to the point where we're measuring lipids. But there was so much dietary fat relative to what this individual was normally consuming, or relative to what any individual, uh, any normal American would be consuming. I think the FDA recommends like fifty to sixty five grams of fat. This individual is eating like over three hundred. There mm -hmm. might have just been some residual dietary fat rather than fat being taken out from um, stored fat tissue. Yeah. Um, okay. So I would suspect in somebody who was, if this was somebody, a case of somebody losing weight who was previously obese, we would have probably seen triglycerides go down. That is actually quite common, where you have dyslipidemia okay. because you're overweight and diabetic. Um, so this is a weight-stable individual. So all these changes were in a weight-stable context, which is actually also important to mention. You know, gotcha. if somebody's losing weight and their LDL goes down and their insulin resistance improves and all that, it might be a factor of the weight loss, not actually a change in the diet itself. Okay. So another control yeah. factor. Makes sense. And the other thing that, I mean, this might come up a little bit further down in the, in the study as we talk about this, but it's interesting because, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me to see a large increase in LDL cholesterol if there was a lot of saturated fat coming in, okay? Because we, we've talked about before, you know, saturated fat can sort of um, decrease kind of the affinity for the LDL receptors in the liver. So you'll sometimes see more a higher level of LDL. But this is unique because the subject wasn't eating a high degree of saturated fat. They were, you know, eating largely mono and polyunsaturated fats. And I think we will touch on this later, but that's what just captivated me. It's like, okay, wait a minute, we still saw LDL increase. There wasn't a lot of saturated fat. So it, it puts my mind at ease because I've sit here worrying about people that do the ketogenic diet. I worry for them because I know they're going to be worried about the saturated fat intake. And this almost puts it at ease saying like, hey, it's not necessarily the saturated fat. It's just this this shift in general, which we can talk about more. Yeah. I I'm, I'm also don't want to make saturated fat on Mediterranean keto out to be the bad guy. I think no. there is a place for it. And we can talk about that at the end because that came in with some of the recommendations we made to further optimize this patient's lipids. It included some do we have saturated fat intake for reasons that we can explain later? But I guess the next step is then, you know, what what we would have seen is what I just described. This individual goes on a ketogenic diet. That's the main change. His cholesterol goes through the roof, and his LDL cholesterol goes through the roof, which would freak out most um, primary care physicians, most cardiologists as well, because those are the tests that are generally measured. So mm -hmm. what did, you know, we do differently is I think the next step to talk about. All right. Well, let's let's get let's get into that. So, what was done differently? All right. Well, actually, before I do that, um, the next second next step. Uh, I want to talk about just a little bit of background about um, why LDL could go up. I think that's relevant. Okay. Because LDL can go up for different reasons. Um, you were talking about LDL metabolism, and um, how you know when LDL particles actually not by saturated fat but by um, glucose and glycation get mm -hmm. oxidized on yeah. what's called the ApoB protein, they can't be taken back up into the liver. So yeah. what happens is you have L the liver makes LDL. It sends LDL out to bring you know fat and fuel to muscles or cholesterol to places it's needed. And then it's supposed to return to the liver and get taken back up. Correct. So what can happen if you have a high carb diet or a westernized diet of sorts, and this is why L, this is what drives the association in westernized culture between, this is what's thought to at least, um, between LDL and um, cardiovascular disease is because when you have this westernized diet, the LDL particles get damaged, they can't return to the liver, they continue to just sit around in the bloodstream, they have nowhere to go, and so they end, end up just like causing plaques. The analogy would be, you know, the, the, the LDL boats are leaving the liver harbor to go dock somewhere else, and then they're supposed to return and be taken back up. But their, you know, travel passport is damaged, and so they just kind of sit around in the harbor, they get further damage, they break down, they sink to the bottom, and then they form a plaque. Yeah, never have an opportunity to properly dock. It's, uh, yeah. And so they just accumulate. Um, yeah. And so that's why LDL will go up. Now, in the case of a low-carb keto diet, what happens is 
you know, your, your, your LDL boats are not getting damaged. Your boat economy is just way better. You're burning more fat. Therefore, you need more LDL to just travel through the bloodstream. And so you have more boats going out. And those more boats are then returning. And so you just have more traffic. But there's yeah. a much faster turnover. And it's, so a, it's, a, it's a more efficient, it's a, it's a booming economic cruise ship company, right? It's just, it's... Booming it's, metabolic cruise. A booming yeah, it's... metabolic uh, system, yeah. I like you, that. Went from, you went from having, let's just hypothetically, in just small numbers, say you've got 10 cruise ships. These 10 cruise ships are going out and doing their job. But then seven of them are getting damaged and ultimately... Uh, lining the ocean floor with garbage and, and, and damage from the cruise ship. Or the other situation is you've got 100 cruise ships and only two of them are getting oxidized and 98 of them are returning back to the station. But after they return back to the station, they unload their passengers and yep. reload. More on, okay. yeah. Yep. And, but in the latter case, the hypothetical, given the numbers you, you gave, would actually be much, much higher, even Correct. though both yep. increase. And so that's the distinction we want to look at. Just to summarize, in the one case, westernized diet, you have damaged LDL that's sinking to the bottom and causing plaques. And in the other case, you have, you know, healthy LDL, but just more of it because you need more boats to traffic more passengers around the bloodstream. So you have this booming metabolic economy. I like that. We should coin that term. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, so yes, that, that is the theory. And other people have speculated on that theory. What's nice is that we actually have a way to look at that. And this is what was cool about this paper is we did that in a clinical context not in an in vitro model, not in an animal model, in a clinical context, where um, you can look at LDL and there are, you know, different types of LDL particles. Now let's talk about that. So LDL, when it's produced, well, different types in that LDL, when it's produced, it's big and fluffy. And okay. actually there's some data to suggest that this is cardioprotective. It, it's healthy for the heart, the big fluffy LDL. So if you have more big fluffy LDL, at least it's associated with lower heart disease. What happens is when it gets damaged or when it's been floating around in the blood and LDL turnover is low, is it condenses down, it gets oxidized, it glycates, it gets small and dense, and that's when it sinks. So you don't, you don't care about the big fluffy. In, in, in fact, you'd want more of it, yeah. if anything. What you care about is the, me, the, the small and to a lesser extent the medium. So excuse me, there is a, you know, um, what you would want in an ideal distribution is a small amount of small LDL and a small amount of medium LDL, a ton of big fluffy. Yeah. And what that would tell you um, is that you have a high LDL, but it's because this high LDL, or it's consistent with the theory that this high LDL is being trafficked out and then returning. It doesn't have time to get damaged and become small and sink down. Right. Because it's, yeah. it's so efficiently doing, you know, its transport job. And so you won't have any deposition into arteries. Um, so you actually, that would mean you have a high LDL, but all of it is big and fluffy. So what did we yeah. see in this patient? And this is what's exciting. Is, again, his LDL jumped from, what was it, 90? Um, sorry, so his LDL jumped from, yeah, 95 to 321. Again, mm -hmm. which would terrify most yeah. GPs because people would presume that, small and medium and large are all going up but this didn't happen the large skyrocketed but the small and medium actually went down <laughs> they, didn't even stay stable, they went down which is by like eight and ten percent each which was well we don't have more than one so we can't do a, a, a statistic test but they went down um which is completely consistent with this hypothesis is his metabolism shift to his fat-based metabolism therefore he needed more LDL, so more LDL went up, but the turnover went down because he was having less oxidation, less inflammation. So although the overall LDL went up, it was just the big fluffy and the small and dense, which are actually the bad types, went down. Interesting, um, yeah. Which is, which was, I mean, that was, I think, the most exciting thing that we found because it's just the most glaring, obvious, and the, the kind of thing that, GP, like again, I said they want this to be a tool that people can bring to their GPs. It's the kind of thing that GPs can go like, oh, wow, look at that. Like, if you go on keto, then the small, dense, and medium don't all go up. It might just be the big, which is good. Maybe. What does this mean? So um, that was exciting. Um, it's, it's interesting because, you know, a similar situation with me, um, you know, I've been keto for so long that after five, six years of doing keto, you know, took a look at a fractionated, you know, LDL test. And the interesting thing is, 
my overall LDL levels did come down from the time that I initially had started keto. Mine were not as high as the subjects, but mine, my LDL went close to 300. And then it came down to uh, a little bit above 200 after being on keto for five years. However, the ratio of fluffy LDL to dense LDL was even better. So it was interesting because then you see, okay, not only am I, I'm just, everything is getting more efficient, right? Everything is getting more efficient to the point where my body doesn't even have to have as many cruise ships. I guess the, the analogy there could be, uh, the booming econ or metabolic economy started out with a hundred cruise ships. And they said, wait a minute, we've determined how to run this leaner rather than having a hundred cruise ships. Let's have 75 larger cruise ships and they make this even more efficient. Um, so it's kind of interesting. And that's at least somewhat of a hypothesis that I've had just based on what I've seen from this paper with my own personal kind of anecdotal stuff. Yeah, I, I, I agree that right now it's in the realm of speculation, but you know, before this paper, there are other things that are like, I think that's a great hypothesis and I tend to agree. And I've also seen similar trends in myself, actually this patient where things tend to just trickle to improvement as you stick with it. So in this patient, we did have some interventions, but, um, and this is not reported in the paper because we're continuing to do follow up, but the LDL is dropped. And um, the HDL, which we can talk about next, has actually gone up in the HDLP. They just continue to trickle up. And this is, the, again, the good cholesterol. Yeah. So and there's, uh, there's, there's five different types of the good cholesterol, ultimately, right? It, it well, uh, at, least. at least five. There's, yeah. The thing with LDL is, okay, I said there are multiple types. When I said there are multiple types, I, I paused and hesitated because I anticipated now saying this. There's actually only one type of LDL, really. Your LDL, like one type produced by the liver. The different types are that it then changes form. And, yeah. You know, well, the, the individual LDL particle will evolve. It'll shrink down. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, one could, one could argue there's like, I mean, it, at what stage of it shrinking down or at what stage of it condensing is it actually measured? One could argue that there's a thousand types of LDL if you're measuring it at smaller it's a, increments. It's a continuum. But when yeah. I say one type, I mean the liver makes one type of LDL. Yeah. The liver makes many types of HDL. We haven't actually classified all of them. Some people say three, four, five. It depends how you break them down. There's really different technologies you can use to um, break down LDL types. Yeah. But L, uh, sorry, sorry, I should have been saying HDL. Break down HDL types. There's three, four, or five types of HDL, um, as opposed to the one type of LDL produced by the liver. And the different LDL morphologies, the different sizes and densities, probably correspond to different jobs. So um, it's it's been thought that. Um, the small dense HDLC3 is the best at what's called reverse cholesterol transport. Kind of taking, you know, this could be the rescue submarine yeah. where it takes uh, the damage out of the arteries. That would be the small dense. And now the bigger LDL, sorry, HDL, I keep on saying LDL, the bigger HDL particles, um, they might be better at antioxidant capacity. That's what they were thought of. Got it. In, in terms of, um, Predictive value right now, the best thing to look at is probably called an HDLP, which is not HDLC is HDL cholesterol. HDLP is the particle count. So you count the number of HDL particles floating around. Okay. And in this participant, the HDLP actually even better is for some reason the HDLP large. So I said the larger the antioxidant ones, which is interesting because HDLC3 is supposed to be the one that is the reverse cholesterol transfer, yeah, which is the yeah. typical function people think about when they think about HDL, but the large HDLP is actually the best predictor of cardiovascular risk. So mm -hmm. food for inflammation thought. Um, <laughs> but anyway, we, we tracked the large HDL um, P in this participant, and it went um, from moderate, which was 5,699 moderate being in the like five to 6,000 range um, to optimal. Optimal being above, um, above 6,729. It went to 12,080, which his GP and um, myself and the other doctor who was on this paper, well, I'm not a doctor yet, but one day, um, all said like, we've never seen something this high. And in fact, we were talking about triple, trickle up. Uh, a couple months later, this wasn't in the paper, although it was in review under that time, it jumped up for about 13,000. So wow. it's, it might still be continuing to go up. It's just interesting. If we had the resources to test every month for like a year, that would be really cool. But unfortunately, Very interesting. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, there was a great increase in HDL, which is also good on top of this increase in large LDL and a decrease in small um, 
and medium LDL particles. And just just a point we make in the paper that I'll make now, in case we show, can we show the, um, at this point, the ion base mobility fractionation? Um, we'll be looking at that now. And the point to make is one, one would speculate based on everything we've just talked about. We said that large LDL is good, small and medium LDL are bad, and there's many different types of HDL, each with probably distinct functions based on their different morphologies and sizes. But that large LD, a large HDL might be, it has the best uh, predictive um, protection, predictive, it, it, it's most correlated rather with protection against cardiovascular disease. All I'm saying is I could speculate off of the information we have from the models that an ideal cholesterol profile will be one with, that is smooth with regards to um, LDL. This is called type A with a big peak in large LDL and a very little small and medium LDL. And mm -hmm. then multimodal with respect to HDL because there's different HDL particles with different functions. And so you want a peak in each small, medium, and large zone because you want all these different functions because they cooperate together. But maybe you'd want the biggest peak in the large HDL because large HDLP is the best predictor of cardiovascular protection among mm -hmm. the HDL counts. Okay. And so summarize, you want a multimodal distribution with HDL, a peak in small, a peak in medium, and the biggest peak in large, and then you want a smooth curve with LDL with very little small, medium, and then a lot of large, and you, you know you can pull up the the figure that is precisely what we see in the follow up with this patient. Interesting. So, and then everything that you've seen. So, this this is interesting because it's such a quick shift and such a quick adaptation. That's what is really just endearing. I mean, it's just it's a really quick adaptation. And I've done a lot of videos talking about the different stages of how long it takes to become fat adapted. You know, there's obviously, you see some acute changes very quickly within a couple of weeks, you see some mitochondrial biogenesis potentially occurring within, you know, a couple of months. And then you kind of have this continued uh, gluconeogenesis efficiency and all this other stuff that kind of changes and skew, I guess it kind of skews the data a little bit because everyone's going to have a different rate there. But this is really interesting to me because it's almost as though this subject became very fat adapted very quickly. Um, now, I don't know if that could be the case for every subject, but that's that's just fascinating to me because so much of the keto world says, okay, it's going to take you, you know, months and months and months to start to see some effect. Um, this is showing that it's pretty quick. I think so. I mean, admittedly, this individual is young and healthy otherwise. Um, and so it wouldn't necessarily be as quick as somebody who's older and insulin resistant and overweight. But True. if you think evolutionarily, I mean, we are omnivores. You know, people say, oh, we you know, only ate meat. Some carnivores say that, but no, we are mm -hmm. omnivores. We ate ketogenic probably during uh, certain months of the year when um, produce was scarce. Yeah. But that would suggest, you know, if it's over the t timeline of months, we did a seven month follow up. You know, you change between, um, you know, the seasons within three month time frames or six months if you have two seasons. So it would only make sense evolutionarily that you could adapt within, you know, windows of six months otherwise mm. you know a couple months otherwise it wouldn't make sense it's like that's very true that's very take true. forever I, to adapt you would just you finish adapting and then you go on to the next season and then it'd be useless yeah well you make yourself glucose intolerant for you know a survival standpoint right especially if in some individuals you don't see as efficient of a process of gluconeogenesis which of course can change depending on someone's muscle mass can change on a lot of different factors so I've always been a firm believer from my own personal experience that as, you know, doing keto for a long period of time, then being able to have a periodic transition on and off of keto um, to be able to be optimally dual fueled, as I would call it, so my body understands still how to metabolize glucose because it just seemed like the most made the most sense from an evolutionary standpoint. Um, so anyway, yeah. this is yeah very interesting that a healthy young individual could adapt so quick. And yes, like you said, I mean, it's important for you watching this video. You know, if you're older, if you're over 40, if you're battling some insulin resistance, it might not happen quite as fast because your body's going to be a little bit more uh, stubborn, but it still happens. Okay, so we've talked about what was optimal, kind of the positive side of this, but we have to be, uh, we have to take sort of a, an objective look at this and talk about things that maybe weren't optimal. So what were some things that maybe you saw within this with the subject that weren't ideal? I mean, not everything is... Uh, 
you know, hunky dory, perfect. There's got to be something that wasn't so great or something that you want to see some improvement on. Yeah. There was really one thing that popped up that concerned me. There were a, a couple markers that didn't change ideally, but this is the one that I think was at the root of it all, and I'll explain why in a minute, and it's explained in the paper. But we we mentioned that his small and medium went LDL went down, which is good, and his large went up, which is good. Um, his oxidized LDL did not. It actually went up a bit, which is not good. We don't want LDL yeah. oxidation. It's interesting that despite the oxidation, which often goes with glycation and becoming small and dense, the small and medium went down. So that's still yeah. very, very reassuring. Um, but his oxidized LDL went up. And as to why that might be, like you said, you know, nothing's ever ideal. You're always kind of asymptotically reaching for perfection. But when you make a shift, it can be an improvement. It doesn't mean it gets to that uh, perfect point. And so some changes that uh, in, in the subject side that might not have been ideal were, you know, he removed a lot of antioxidant-rich foods, including mm. vitamin C-rich foods. Um, mm. And we'll talk about the importance of vitamin C in a minute. But uh, And then he was also, and I, I mentioned this earlier, eating a ton of olive oil. All, it was great quality olive oil. Alta Cresta Premium Virgin 2019 Harvest. We collected a ton of data. Um, well, at least it's 2019 Harvest now. But... Um, you know, the good stuff. Still, uh, olive oil is 12-ish percent omega-6. It's a ton of, um, you know, great MUFA, but there is some omega-6 which are inflammatory. Now, if you're eating a standard diet and having a tablespoon or two a day, that's not a big deal. Yeah. But if you're eating 16 tablespoons, which is in a cup, a day, multiply that by the 12% times the 14 grams of fat, and you are getting loads of um, omega-6 fat from that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not doing the mental math right now. My head, but let's round it to 10. Let's say he had just 10 tablespoons, and it's 10%. Uh, then that's 14 grams of the omega-6 just in the olive oil. Yeah, not that's a mention, lot. He was eating some, you know, not all the nuts he was eating were macadamia, which are the only nuts that really don't have omega-6. So there were other nuts in there. There were walnuts he was eating quite a bit of, but walnuts... One ounce has 11 grams. They're omega-6 bombs. So these these little tweaks, which, you know, or, or the, these, these changes could have increased inflammation and oxidative stress by mm -hmm. an omega-6 load and by removing some antioxidants like vitamin C. That's, that's well, and that's super intriguing because, I mean, you mean, it's funny because you look at walnuts, right? And walnuts technically also have a higher omega-3 content than a lot of nuts. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's that ratio, it's that balance there, right? So it's like one could market walnuts and say they're high omega-3. Well, that's true, but it also doesn't deny the fact that you know, they're high in omega-6s that essentially counteracts that. Um, the other thing to note is, of course, whenever you're looking at the omega-3s that are coming from a, a plant source, I mean, you're looking at alpha linolytic acid, which quite frankly is hard to convert and ferment into the usable, you know, uh, EPA or whatever you need, right? So, of course, we have talked about the little hack with turmeric to increase that bioavailability, but at the end of the day, it's still negligible. Yeah. So when it comes to nuts, I always recommend, and I think you recommend the same, that the three to six ratio, which people talk about, is actually not that relevant because the meaningful omega threes and a large amount of omega threes, you're not you're not getting from nuts. Correct. So it's only yeah. the omega six that actually matter. So yeah. think about the 11 grams. Don't think about what is three divided by 11. Because then you yeah. go to macadamia nuts and it's like, there's no omega-3s. There's very little omega-6. but So there's like 0. 0.000 whatever. But then you look at the ratio and the macadamia ratio is worse. So yeah, it's like it's a... It's a, it's a, it's a think about the omega-6, not the ratio. Yeah. With fish, it's a, it's a, it's a drop years. in the bucket. Drop in the bucket for sure. And well, I think the most important thing for anyone watching this video, if you're watching this video, that this is what this instills is that when you are on a ketogenic diet, Okay, your diet becomes significantly more fatty, right? A lot more fats coming in. And that simply means that you have to pay a lot closer attention to that omega-6 ratio than you ordinarily would. And again, hypothetically, again, like kind of you said, if you if you're typically consuming, you know, let's say 30 grams of fat throughout the course of a day. Well, if your omega-6 ratio is off when those 30 grams of fat, it's it's not great, but it's not the end of the world because the overall volume of omega-6 is coming in isn't super high. Then you look at the ketogenic diet or any any even paleo where your fats are increased. I mean, you just obviously that becomes a larger proportion of your overall macronutrient breakdown, which means that that omega-6 profile 
could be a lot more threatening to you. So you just have to pay a lot closer attention. So this, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, um, you know, you're doing a good job of bringing up some of the nuances that happen when you shift your macronutrient focus. And something I said earlier was, you know, I don't want to make saturated fats out to be the bad guy. Um, because, um, you know, you and I have talked about this concept of the fat tome before, how mm -hmm. it's not just like, you know, how you have your genome and your microbiome, it's the, your genetics or your gut bugs all interacting to determine your health. The dietary fats you eat, especially when you're on keto, also interact. And so you want to find the right balance. And when you're doing Mediterranean keto, it might be optimized, if you're having a ton and ton of fat, to balance it out with just a little bit of stable saturated fats, like virgin coconut products. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'll just divulge this. We're doing some follow-up studies. We're probably going to try to make it a case series, not a case study. But on this individual, um, some of the recommendations we made and the predictions we made were, all right, let's you know, try to swap out some of your, um, you know, olive oil for some coconut. Now, the literature is going to say, there's problems with the coconut literature. You mostly they use refined products, which have lost 85% of their antioxidants. But the literature is going to say that would make his LDL worse um, and maybe contribute to oxidation, whatever. So we swapped in some virgin coconut butter, uh, raw coconut butter, rather, it's called. Um, Artisanas Organics, great brand. I have no connections to them financially, but I think it's tasty. Um, and what we saw is actually um, a decrease in the oxidized LDL as predicted. We also saw an 80 milligrams per deciliter drop in the LDL total, mm. which is impressive, both in small and medium. Um, and uh, decreases in other things like LP little a and um, other factors. So just to kind of get the, to throw in this idea that, um, you know, balancing your fats a little bit when you're doing Mediterranean keto, maybe a little bit of ghee, which has some butyrate as well, maybe a little bit uh, virgin coconut oil aren't a bad thing. I'm not saying have a lot, but yeah. maybe two to three tablespoons a day if you're, you know, out of the 10 tablespoons of olive oil you're having, and you're still getting all those healthy monounsaturated fats. But then you have these other fats that say the lower gas in the coconut is going to burn faster. And then you later have, you know, the MUFAs for helping with heart health, X, Y, Z. It's a complicated area. I'm just trying to help introduce a little bit of nuance into it. So I wanted to mention that. Yeah. Well, I think you started to touch on something by like, introducing a, just a bit more in the way of vitamin C rich foods, you know, having kind of an antioxidant aspect there because it's easy. And let's, let's take a look at just someone that's starting a ketogenic diet that isn't focusing on maybe a Mediterranean style in the first place. I mean, imagine someone that is jumping into keto and they're going and they're just, they're, they're kudos to them because they're taking the right steps, but they're starting just with whatever they can get their hands on right there. You know, perhaps they're eating just a bunch of uh, burgers and, and cheese and things like that. Well, okay. You were eating Mediterranean keto, which means you at least had some antioxidants coming in from the olive oil, you know, the um, hydroxychlorine, you had some of these other things, right? But when you look at what most people would be eating when they start a ketogenic diet, they're probably very deficient in antioxidants. And we have to pay attention to the fact that there's a difference between inflammation modulation from a ketone and oxidative stress, right? And oxidative damage. Like there's a difference just because you're controlling or potentially controlling inflammation doesn't necessarily mean that you aren't having a higher degree of oxidation occurring at some level, right? So I would actually contend on that, and inflammation and oxidative stress are highly interlinked. What I would say is that if you're eating dirty keto, the way I would cast it is you're counteracting some of the positive effects. So you're doing this Correct. great work cutting out the carbs, and you get the ketones coming in, and um, you're reducing inflammation, but then you're contributing to inflammation via just having a nutrient deficient and um, you know otherwise dirty diet. And so you will be getting this positive effect, but instead you're going to get this positive effect because you've just canceled out a bunch of it with a dirty diet. Yeah, that's very true. And when you look at, um, you know, oxidative damage, and you look at kind of even the um, mitochondria being less efficient, you have this reactive oxygen species that's affecting that, then of course that's going to, in effect, you know, trigger damp and trigger all kinds of different things. Damp, by the way, is, you know, damage associated, basically this inflammatory response. So yeah, you can directly have this sort of, constant cycle that's occurring between reactive oxygen species and inflammation. So I think exactly what you're explaining is, yeah. is what I'm saying is you're, you're negating all the positive effects there. Yeah. So if you're bringing in foods that are going to be damaging, if you're bringing in foods that are unhealthy, then 
Yes, modulating inflammation is still good, but you could be essentially canceling it out in some ways. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the analogy, uh, and this is a really important point, because keto gets a lot of um, crap for being nutrient poor. I hear that all the time, and I read it in like the Atlantic or whatever. They're like, you know, keto, you know, you can lose weight, but then you're discouraged from eating fruits and vegetables, and it's nutrient poor, so blah, blah, blah. That is such an unfair argument. That's like saying, and here's my analogy, that vegetarian diets are fundamentally unhealthy because... If you only eat Oreos, then you're nutrient deficient. Like, yes, an Oreo diet is a vegetarian diet, just like beef jerky and cheese Whiz is a ketogenic diet. But <laughs> that's not a fair comparison. Yeah. Um, so, so, yes, ketogenic diet can be nutrient deficient, but it doesn't need to be. Yeah. And so the th issue is there's, people aren't educated. Healthcare protect practitioners aren't generally educated, so they can't support um, their patients in this ship. So people tend to just have an easy rule, I'm going to cut out carbs, and then it's easiest to rely then on kind of dirty food. So to do a well-balanced ketogenic diet, that's what kind of Steve Finney says, or well-formulated, that's what you really need to get to. And that's on the fault of scientists, nutritionists, and, um, you know, physicians for, you know, they need to, there needs to be support to teach people what to do to make a clean keto diet. Because you don't want to be eating beef, jerky, and cheese. It was just like, you know, you don't want to be eating Oreos for your vegetarian diet, thinking it's healthy. Correct, correct. And, you know, it's a great spot to mention that a little bit of fruit on the ketogenic diet is not going to destroy it. You know, I'm a big fan of having, you know, even a few times per week, I'll have a quarter cup to a half a cup of strawberries, you know, low glycemic fruit, great way to get some, you know, get some vitamin C in. Don't be afraid to have a little bit of bell pepper or things like that. And I know that in the paper it specifically mentions those. And yeah. that's uh, I would say though, it, 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 you don't need fruit. If you do have fruit, like you said, have berries, but you don't need fruit. And people think like an orange is a great source of vitamin C. It's not a great source of vitamin C whatsoever. You know, uh, a hundred grams of cauliflower has more vitamin C. Yeah, correct. A zucchini yeah. has more vitamin C. Um, a head of cauliflower is eight times the vitamin C of an orange. I think bell peppers you mentioned, broccoli, they're both great. Yeah, obviously, yeah, going for the, uh, you know, the lower carbohydrate versions, of course, are going to obviously be better. I mean, additionally, you have to remember that vitamin C's and glucose are going to compete for absorption. So you have to factor that in too. So you look at orange juice, it's probably not the best way to get your vitamin C in. So, yeah. you know, Broccoli is going to come with the other benefits of sulfurethane and everything like that, too, which is obviously good. Um, we also don't know what the production of endogenous vitamin Well, humans don't produce vitamin C like other animals, but maybe our gut bacteria do. They've genetically engineered bacteria to do so. And so I only bring this up because I've been questioned by the carnivore community on this. It's like, yeah. oh, people do fine on carnivore. I'm like, I don't know why that is. Some people seem to do well. I, I don't think it's optimal for most people. But if you do, then maybe there's a shift in your microbiome where you're converting you know, some glucose there, and there is glucose on a carnivore diet, you can get glycogen in liver or whatever, yeah. um, into vitamin C. Maybe your gut bacteria are producing it. I don't know. It could very well be. I mean, there's so but many gut biomes. There are a lot of, I'm just saying a lot of, a lot of variables. So maybe on keto, you have a shift in your microbiome that improves vitamin C uptake efficiency or whatever. Who knows? Yeah. No, that's be, that'd be an interesting one to dive into a little yeah. bit more. But another so, thing about vitamin C, the reason um, it's particular in this paper, the reason we mentioned it in addition to the antioxidant capacity is something that went up uh, in this patient's blood was something called LP little a, mm -hmm. which is not studied much. It's kind of like LDL, but it has an extra little tail. Yeah. Its job is this is a hypothesis by Linus Pauling, the only person to ever win two Nobel Prizes. And we can link to a, a lay article about it in the show notes. But the hypothesis is that LP little a acts as a surrogate for vitamin C. So most animals produce their own vitamin C. Animals that don't tend to produce this little LP little a particle. Now, what vitamin C does, in addition to being an antioxidant, with regards to cardiovascular health specifically, is it's important in repairing our artery walls. When they get damaged, you need the vitamin C to rebuild it, to rebuild the collagen, it's like prolyl hydroxylation, et cetera, whatever, multiple steps, and you get rebuilding the artery walls. But if you can't have it rebuilt, if you're vitamin C deficient, what you need to do is um, put up barriers, kind of cordon it off, generate a clot so you don't get excess bleeding. Um, and a clot is a plaque. And so LP little a does that job. It binds where vitamin C would help repair. 
um, and prevents this uh, clotting factor plus minogen from um, becoming uh, activated. Uh, so then you, um, you know, get the clot, you get the plaque. So that's why LP little a is associated with um, cardiovascular disease, or that's why it's thought. But again, it's a, it's a surrogate for vitamin C. So if you're vitamin C deficient, you have an increase in the LP little a. Yeah. If you add in vitamin C, then the LP little a comes down, and you don't get the clot, you don't get the plaque. Yeah. I also will mention, because this is relevant to the paper, um, you know, to get a paper published like this, you need, it's really helpful to have a functional measure of um, uh, cardiovascular plaque buildup. And so one thing you can do is called the coronary arium calcium scan, where you actually look at the plaque buildup. And so that's kind of the most important thing. You know, that's the proof is in the pudding. Um, and so we did a CAC score on this patient, and it was zero. Even with an LDL of 321, a total cholesterol of 450, there was no noticeable plaque accumulation. Admittedly, this individual is young in his 20s, so you know that could be a contributing factor. But it was something important to include. You know, being good scientists, we wanted to try to disprove our hypothesis. If we saw all these changes in lipid parameters, but there was this jump in plaque, that's terrible. The fact yeah. that the score is zero is. You know, it doesn't prove anything, but it's reassuring, if nothing else. Yeah, so we did do a functional test of plaque buildup, and there was a CAC score of complete zero. So we'll continue wow. to follow up, and I will definitely let you know if it increases. You can uh, let everybody else know, but I don't think it will. Well, no, this is awesome. This is, I mean, this is everything that we need to start getting the Mediterranean keto diet out there. And I know the Mediterranean keto diet wasn't the emphasis of this study and it wasn't, you know, designed to be that way, but it was taking a look at, okay, let's see some true case studies in the world of Mediterranean keto, because this, I can say from my own personal opinion, my own experience, this is not your words. This is not um, you know, any research words, but I think the Mediterranean keto diet is kind of the future of the keto diet. And I'm excited to see where this can go. And the biggest piece for me with the Mediterranean keto diet, again, speaking just from my heart, is it drops a barrier for people that might be concerned about just some of the, I don't know, kind of um, nefarious foods that are out there in the ketogenic world, you know, foods that might just seem a little bit daunting and seem like just overall unhealthy, right? People just start, are feeling like, I don't want to eat, just like you said, cheese whiz and beef jerky all the time. This opens up a new realm of hey, here's keto, but look how bright and colorful it is and look how healthy it is. And I think it's going to allow a lot of the mainstream to really see it in a different light. And I think it's going to do the ketogenic community just a huge service to be able to help promote the Mediterranean keto diet. So I'm, I'm really excited about this paper for that reason. That's why I wanted to be involved in it. And Nick, uh, you know, it's a pleasure. And as always, man, I appreciate all your help, everything that you help us do with this channel and bring good research and, and I'm happy to have you in front of the audience and hopefully we can do this a heck of a lot more too. Yeah. No, thank you so much. I think that's a, an excellent um, point to conclude on. I do want to add just one thing because it would irk me as a responsible scientist not to say this is I, I don't mean this paper to be conclusive. It is an N equals yeah. one. It has its limitations. It's in a 24 year old. I mean, you know, this would be, we, we, we can't idealize clinical cases. It was just taking advantage of an opportunity we saw so that people look one thing that well people will have tools then to bring or a tool to bring to their physicians, but just to inspire other people to follow up on this research so we can actually do the real clinical trials so that people can get proper testing so they can get better information. Um, we have to start somewhere. Right. <laughs> exactly. We have to start somewhere. So I'm not saying this is perfect. I can poke holes in it to no end, but it's an exciting next step. And, um, you know, I would just, I, I, more than anything, I hope that this will help people argue to their GPs for better testing so that they can have more informed decisions. And if their GP still wants to put them on a statin and get them off the keto diet, they can have that discussion then. But at least this is a next step yeah, where people absolutely. can have something to argue. Um, well, so that, that is great. There's a couple links down below in the description. Didn't mean to cut you off there. I just want everyone to know that, you know, there's there's some links to um, just some highly recommended pieces, but also a link to this study in particular. So I highly, highly, highly recommend. Uh, yes, we did this in-depth video on it, but read it for yourself, download it for yourself. Um, I do want to mention that the way these things work in the research world with some of these published studies, uh, the more people that get to this study and look at it and read it and hit that website and, and actually look at the PDF, 
it does rate algorithmically to some degree and it allows it to get pushed forward more in the medical community. So more physicians will see it, more researchers will see it. This is why, actually I have a lot of, I have a lot of publications that do come to me saying, hey, can you help me by getting this out? And obviously I don't do that with everybody. Nick's a, a very good friend and I'm involved in this study. So it played a big part, but please, if you want, you can do your part by just, just going and reading the study and just checking it out. It will make a big difference and let you be a part of pushing this along in the medical community a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. That's a huge help. Um, thank you. So, well, Nick, uh, we'll do this again soon, man. And as always, everyone keep it locked in here on the channel. We'll be bringing more Mediterranean keto content throughout the summer and throughout the fall. And we'll see everyone soon. Bye, man. Cool.